I'm going to bring back up on stage Catherine Fraze. Also, we have two of our innovators under 35 joining us today. First, we have Laura Schul, who is the founder and CEO of a company called Streetlight Data. Actually, I want to get you over here. Oh, I know. Yeah. Uh, Streetlight Data is doing some really interesting work uh, using aggregated and anonymized cell phone location data that businesses and governments can use to make smarter decisions. And also we have Yu Zhang, another innovator under 35. He's a researcher with uh, Microsoft in Beijing. Um, some of you may have seen his presentation yesterday. He's doing some very interesting work around um, real-time air quality monitoring and making better maps that make smarter use of information about traffic in cities. So welcome, everybody, and thank you for, thank you for joining us. So I'm curious. Um, you know, we talk about smart cities and it's this sort of general thing, a lot of technologies go into it, but let's take a step back. How smart can a city really be? Sometimes, you know, with buzzwords, you sort of start to accept, oh, smarter cities, but what does that even really mean? Because cities are always going to be imperfect, they're going to be dynamic, they're going to be unpredictable. That's what makes cities exciting in the first place. So anyone want to take that on? What's, how, is there a maximum intelligence the smart city can have? I think there's kind of a split between the two trends in smart cities right now. One is talking about these very hyper real time elements of smartness, like being able to tell you, oh, this bus is coming and it's going to be more convenient, or in like an IBM uh, transportation management center, or instantly knowing, oh, these lights need to be timed differently in this situation. So that's one element of smart cities, and I think that's getting the most of the emphasis, most emphasis right now. I think the fundamental smartness, maybe we can call it wisdom because it's deeper, has to do with some of the bigger long-term planning issues that I think uh, we've, we've actually done a great job hitting on in the first two presentations today. The fundamental design issues. Is the city going to sprawl with boulevards? Is it going to have ring roads? Are you going to start satellite cities? And how are you going to connect them? Those deeper, longer lead time intelligence, I think that's where we have a long way to go in terms of enhancing more wisdom in our cities. Anyone else want to take? Yeah, maybe yeah, I, will, I will add just, you know, we, we, we really don't like the name smart cities. You know, smart cities sounds like, you know, you're, you're making your city just as a computer. I think it should be really, it's about people in the city. But if you look at planning, planning tradition, if you lead like Eliezer Reclus over 100 years ago, he was talking about planning as the two processes about serving, collecting information, and then planning itself, you know, making decisions about how the city should grow. And that is really the sensing and actuating. So what is happening? Really, if you look at this, it's not about discussing how smart the city is, but we can actually have a different engagement, uh, engage in a different way with our built environment. And you know, that's about sensing and actuating. It's about almost having, a live, having things, our cities, our buildings, our apartments, talking to us. And uh, you know, there was an exhibition at MoMA in New York at the Museum of Modern Art we were, we were part of that was called Talk to Me. The idea that this technology is making our cities, our buildings, talk back to us. And I think that's the exciting thing. Well, you, you've done some really interesting stuff that yeah. is, is really already here now in connecting different systems, right? Right. So we have a region of urban computing that connects urban sensing, data management, uh, data analytics, and service providing, and connect them in a loop for recurrent and unobtrusive improvement for people's lives, city environment, and city operating system. So this is a win-win-win situation. We hope the problem can be automatically discovered by the data we have and can automatically be solved by the technology we have. We can use technology to connect people, citizens, with government who are decision making. But the city is owned by people. Okay. So we need a channel to deliver the message of people to the government automatically through the data they generated. So we are here using a loop connecting different kind of technology to provide a better city and better life. So that's all we do. Yeah. So in other words, the connecting of multiple systems, you see things that you wouldn't see from managing any one of them in isolation. Yeah, especially in, in, in urban community, urban scenario. Even in one project, say we want to improve urban planning, you need to harness a variety of data. You need to look at, look at the traffic, and you need to look at land use, and you need to look at the population. It's not a separate problem. They're connected. So we are calling for technology that can learn mutually reinforcement knowledge from different kind of data. You, you have many data, but that's not mean you can definitely learn better knowledge with more data. So how can we learn 
better knowledge from different kinds of data, how to aggregate this data. So that's important, yeah. I think there's one, maybe one other aspect to a smarter city. We, we heard in the, in the first session about entrepreneurship. And so there are cities that are beginning to say, so I'll, I'll take Dublin as an example, um, that are saying, wait, I want to encourage entrepreneurship in my city. What if... You know, I, the city, will decide what data gets posted so that I'm not posting anything that's personal information. But what if we made a lot of the city's own data publicly available? What would entrepreneurs do with it? And so the, the city of Dublin and the surrounding suburbs have been on this for a couple of years now. And a number of startups have come out of it. Uh, a number of new applications have been written that are helping the city itself function more efficiently. But it's another angle on what does it mean to be a smart city in terms of what can a city do with its own data to build entrepreneurship and vitality in its economy. What's an example? What's Dublin doing with that information that's making the city more efficient? So for example, the, the city posted, uh, they posted a lot of traffic data, they posted a lot of water data, they posted some building energy use data. Um, and then entrepreneurs looked at that and said, oh, wait a second. You know, if I connect this and that, one of the one of the maybe holy grails in a city is, could I really do something about the energy footprint of my water system, which are traditionally two things that that you can't find that data in the same place. But if you link these sources, as you said, right, you can actually start addressing what is the energy bill the city is paying for its water system, and what could you do about it? So Carla, you mentioned briefly privacy, and I think that's a really important question. Privacy is a little bit sometimes of a murky term, but it, it, you know, there's a theme running through all of this, which is that cities are gonna be wiser by having more and more data to, to act on. This data is provided by people themselves going about their daily movements, whether they know it or not. How can these systems be uh, transparent and useful and without sort of, you know, d making people feel that they're being sort of watched like bugs under glass, right? And, uh, and I think it's a, it's a great question. And, you know, I, you know, let me just make an example. If you look at this room, like if I had been here like 20 years ago, in this room we might have had like perhaps two or three cameras. You know, people would take pictures, some of those pictures would take time to print them, they would go in a drawer, and then after, you couldn't search them digitally f easily, and then after 20, 30 years they would disappear. Now you fast forward 20 years, there's probably 500 cameras here, every phone has two, every laptop has, uh, has at least one, and you know, a lot of you are taking pictures or recording and so on, and even something as innocent as uh, taking pictures today is becoming, becoming an issue from this point of view. As you know, some countries that are, have started banning the Google Street View card on, on privacy grounds. And that tells us that this is something much more profound than what we're discussing today. It's not about smart cities. It's not about cities at all. It's really about a society that we're building that's actually combining, recording everything. And in this society, many, there's many consequences. It's going to be much more difficult to forget. Um, it's going, uh, you know, there's going to be many other consequences that we want to explore. Now, the discussion about how to address this new condition is, uh, I think it, it would take probably too long to address today. Uh, just a couple of quick things. Uh, the first one is, uh, for any, if anybody's interested, uh, the Italian writer Italo Calvino, in the 1969, imagined a condition. He wrote a little story called The Memory of the World. And imagine a condition where everything is recorded. And it's useful to read the little story, because at the end of the story, actually, what it happens, the story inevitably ends up with drama, tragedy, and murder. And I think, you know, there's something interesting that he was just doing a Gedanken experiment about thinking what would happen when you can record every possible thing. And the other thing is, you know, probably none of us has the right solution about this. This is really going to change a lot of things in our society. The only thing I know is that actually what our society will be tomorrow depends on the actions we make today all together. So it's a theme that we should all discuss and engage with. And on the 15th of November, we are doing here on the MIT campus a panel, a discussion called Engaging Data, really on these topics. Uh, we'll kick off with a, with a, with a panel with uh, Noam Chomsky, uh, the professor activist here, uh, Barton Gelman, uh, the Pulitzer Prize winner, who actually leaked Ed Snowden uh, into the Washington Post, and perhaps a surprise guest uh, remotely connected as well. Uh, and, uh, and that's really because we want that this discussion is really part of, uh, of, of our agenda, because this will shape what our society will be tomorrow. 
I want to leave time for questions from the audience, but Laura, why don't you expand on this? You've had to think about this question a lot in building your startup, right? Yeah, so Italo Calvino also wrote Invisible Cities in which the same city could be lived in dozens and dozens of different ways. And I think that with the privacy issue and the data privacy issue, we're experiencing a little of that. With the two parallel layers being business, particularly marketing, and government and smarter cities. And it's, and what we see with the Snowden affair is the similar data to what has been collected for marketing purposes from cellular phones, from GPS navigation systems, data streams, which my company also utilizes in an anonymized way. Um, there was a little bit of reaction to that. But when the phrase that the government was looking at the data came out, there was a step change in people's reactions. And in fact, the, the purposes that the government nominally are using them for are, I think, more laudable and have a lot more benefit to the people whose data is being collected, if we're talking about transit applications or water use or urban design, than marketing Starbucks coffees to people. But, but the, the, the emotional reaction from the citizens was very strong. Um, so I think we have to be very aware of those two parallel issues. And, and Catherine brings up the key issue of that, which is one of the things cities are trying to do is encourage entrepreneurship. But that's blurring the lines. And in, the data is the thing that's being used to connect the businesses in the cities. And I, my whole business relies on that. I think that's a wonderful thing. But I know that it requires very careful stewardship and that people have a lot of caution about it. But the last thing I want to see say is um, when the Snowden affair hit, uh, Streetlight Data, which collects a huge amount of, of data from cellular phones, from navigation systems, in a way that's completely technically different and completely anonymized, um, Nobody had the patience to listen to our technical explanation of the differences. They just heard the big picture story, and perhaps that's appropriate. I mean, we were very concerned, and the reaction has died. Um, Snowden slides are coming out every week. There's hardly any coverage. And so we were not surprised when the reaction started. We've been shocked at how much it's gone away. Um, so I wonder if the American public, at least, is already getting accustomed and changing their reaction to the privacy issue in near real time. I know things are different in Europe. So I, I could go on. Before in the comments, so one is about technology, about data anonymization. You can use the data aggregately and then find out connective knowledge from different kind of data. And second thing is, what's the benefit you can provide? It's always a trade-off between privacy and benefit. If you can provide a user with real benefit, I think people are going to share their data. So, yeah. I just want to see if there's a question. It looks like there is because we're running low on time. If anyone wants to. Grab a mic. Looks like there's one over here. Yeah, great stuff. Um, and lots of insights on how the citizens and the community could benefit as well as how society, the community as a whole, could benefit. But as, as I was you know, looking at the various graphs and seeing, you know, walking down the streets or driving down the streets, there are an awful lot of retailers as well lined along those streets and the like. How did the retailers think about perhaps contributing to as well as benefiting from this kind of information that exists uh, in a society. I think um, a great example of that is a, is a friend company of Streetlights, another company. Um, and there's actually several companies that are uh, putting out pedestrian sensors. Um, so vehicle count sensors are, are kind of standard and, and retailers are used to using them. But pedestrian count sensors, the retailers are putting up. And in San Francisco, there's an initiative for all of them to pool those pedestrian counts and give them back to the city government so that the city government won't have to go through the expense of putting up the sensors themselves. Um, and Streetlight also does similar processes where we collect data for retailers and then have a higher level aggregation that we give back to the cities. Because it's in the retailer's interest as it always has been, that the city be a vibrant place for shopping. I think there's another one back over here. Uh, Graham Ron from MIT. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, Lily's intercity connections. And I wonder if you can also talk about intercity connections uh, that between cities through this all emerging mm -hmm. technologies. In reality, probably not just technologies only, for the system engineering as well. Thanks. Uh, happy to do it. Um, well, well, something quite interesting is actually how you can uh, use a lot of this data, especially telecommunication data, now to understand those flows to a way, in, in a way that you couldn't before. Um, again, you know, the, the cell phone network is something quite recent. Uh, you know, we had, didn't have this data just a decade ago. 
in, to, to analyze. And, and if you use that, you can really understand much better the connection, how people move in an aggregated way, and then the connection between, say, a city, the suburbs, the satellite. And I think that's one of the most exciting things you know, in, in, in looking forward about new ways of doing planning, you know, getting this information and seeing how we can actually plan a, a better city. Yeah, I think the other piece to that is, you know, we, we do, we tend to talk about the data and the analytics and maybe the visualization of the result. But at the end of the day, in, a, in an example like an intercity uh, problem, what's the business process to enable anybody to take advantage of it? We can do it, right? The question is going to start being policy and, and public um, enterprises, right? Are they really willing to do the collaboration that the data could enable to do a better job of traffic between two close cities, for example? Mm -hmm. right? So workflow, business processes, and those pesky humans, you know, are a big piece of it too. Well, you four are great. I wish we could talk more about this. We are out of time, unfortunately. So I want to stop here and say thank you to all of you. Thank, thank you. you.